Tony Silva in Tomorrow, an exotic pets family in Pakistan. I will be answering 25 questions. Many of you know that aviculture is my passion. In fact, I didn't even shave today because I wanted to get up and take the day off and work with my birds. They are my passion and I have 45 years of experience. I will be sharing some of that knowledge. I will be dis discussing nursery management, nursery protocol. I'll touch on incubation. I'll tell you what you can do to be much more successful. I'll tell you about polyoma and beacon feather. Those are two huge problems in Pakistan. And the only way you can get rid of those problems is by actively culling infected birds, burning nests and perches, and anything else that those birds have come in contact with. Because both beacon feather and polyoma are viruses that have no treatment. I'll be discussing how to make birds a little bit more productive, how to make them healthier, how to extend their life. I will be discussing pairing and many of those subjects related to breeding. I look forward to talking with you, to chatting with you, and I promise that I'll be shaven. Cheers. When you bring chicks into the nursery, you need to segregate those that were, were with parents from those that were incubator hatched. The reason is that parents tend to have a bacterial load, uh, not necessarily a bad bacteria, but they tend to have some bacteria in them that the chicks hatched in an incubator do not have. When the parents feed their own young, they're transferring a lot of these bacteria to the chicks. And if you mix those chicks with those that are, were incubator hatched, you're going to have problems. It is important to keep them segregated. It's also important to uh, keep them segregated in different rooms if you can, because a chick uh, could come from a pair contaminated with polyoma or beacon feather, whereas it may be possible to hatch an egg if the egg has been duly disinfected from a contaminated pair, you may be able to hatch that egg and that chick may be disease clean, disease free. So it's important to keep the chicks separate, ideally in separate rooms, to wash, to disinfect, to use different tools. You need to segregate them. You need to consider chicks that were with the parents as being suspect and those with uh, that were incubator hatched as being uh, immune deficient, very weak immune system because they have not experienced the bacteria. I do not believe we should feed peanuts at all. Peanuts tend to be contaminated with aflatoxins and they uh, can be very, very lethal to birds. Uh, Peanut butter can be used because the peanuts are roasted. The problem is, is that you just don't want to smear the peanut butter on the food. What I always recommend and what we do here is we take a whole grain bread that's very good quality and then we make peanut butter sandwiches. We then offer those to the birds. We don't use peanuts. We also use nuts. Uh, fat should only be supplemented for macaws and African greys, never for Amazons. Amazons are very susceptible to obesity and an obese Amazon is an infertile Amazon. So provide the fat only for those species that truly need it, which are African greys and macaws. The best nesting material is one that is very absorbent we use shavings but it's very important that when you feed chicks that their diet their formula contain enough fat because if there is not enough fat they will eat the shavings and that will cause crop uh, the crop to impact so what we do is we make sure that we are at about a 21 percent fat in the hand rearing formula and that we don't let the chicks go hungry crying all day because when they're hungry and they're crying all day they will eat anything within their reach whether it be shavings that are used as a substrate or newspaper or whatever you use as a tub lining 
Uh, I don't like to keep chicks on, on wire because it's very unnatural and I've seen chicks wear their vents and bleed and catch bacterial infection uh, as a result of being kept on wire. And these, these sores happen because many chicks, when they're about to defecate, they back up and rub their vent. Their vent. When they rub their vent against wire, it, it causes uh, the, the bruising and the cuts. We keep chicks on um, uh, shavings and we use pine shavings that are soft. We like a medium grade. If it's too large, they don't absorb well. And if it's too fine, it can get into their eyes. It can get into their mouth. So we use a medium sized uh, pine shavings. It's very absorbent. You can also use cellulose. You can use ground corn cob. You can use shredded paper, whatever you use. The key is changing it often. We change uh, the chicks three times a day. We wanna keep them clean because if they're not clean, they come in contact with all of the, these bacteria that are in the droppings. The bacteria begins to grow. It causes uh, moisture and you create all kinds of health issues. Uh, to me, it's very simple. Either you, you follow strict hygiene and you have a very successful nursery or you cut corners by not keeping them clean enough, by not feeding them the proper formula and then all you're doing is you're gonna lose chicks. And in the end, you're not going to be as successful as you could if you adhered to very strict hygiene. We use plastic tubs um, I like plastic tubs because they're easy uh, to clean. What we do is we wash everything out in soap water first, and then we bleach them. And the reason that we use soap and water first is because organic matter, such as droppings, uh, food, etc., tends to nullify the disinfectant properties of a disinfectant. So by washing them first in soap and water, rinsing them in a disinfectant, and then we air dry them. We use plastic because we can get sizes that are square or round um, that can fit into an incubator. We want to keep about six tubs per incubator and we can get plastic tubs that fit in very precisely. You can use round bowls, but chicks uh, can, can stick their head in between the bowls and get caught. So we just use square plastic tubs, uh, preferably. Sometimes. We don't have the right size and we'll use a few round ones, but when we do use round ones, we, we separate them so that a chick can't stick his head down, pull it up and get stuck between two round bowls. Nursery disinfectant is key. We wash the walls, we wash the shelves, we wash everything daily. Uh, first, we use soapy water and then we use bleach water. We pay particular attention to areas that can gather dust because many diseases, including polyoma and beacon feather, thrive in these dusty areas. So strict hygiene is very important. It's also good to have a proper filtration system. Uh, babies that are beginning to feather out produce a lot of dust from the sheaths that cover their feathers as they break apart. That creates dust, it creates uh, uh, poor hygiene. So if you have a good air filtration system and a HEPA, a high efficiency particular filter, works really well at pulling out all these matters. If you can't afford one, a regular square fan with a sponge attached to the intake, to the back, works fairly well. You just have to wash the sponge out once or twice a day. The ideal nursery temperature is 25 degrees Celsius because that is a temperature that allows brooders to operate most efficiently. We want to keep the chicks in brooders as short as possible. The minute we can pull them out and put them into tubs, uh, we will do that. And the reason we want to do this is, is, is multifold. One, a brooder uh, tends to be enclosed, it's hot, there's humidity 
and it's a perfect place for bacteria. Once a chick is in a tub, we try to keep several chicks together. Uh, we try to keep clutch mates where possible or chicks that were reared together in the same brooder so that they can generate heat and stay warm. There's greater airflow in tubs and therefore it's easier uh, to have uh, good, good air circulation in those. Um, the humidity, we try to keep it at 48%. High humidity only contributes uh, to a, a good growing environment for bacteria. Yes, we want to separate chicks that were incubator hatch from those that were parent reared. We want to make sure that if you are bringing in chicks from other nurseries, from other collections, that you isolate those because it is very easy to bring in a pathogen. We allow visitors throughout the year, but if we are uh, breeding birds and the nursery has chicks, we ask them to wear a smock, to wash their hands, not to touch, an touch anything, and to wear a smock because they can easily bring in a bacteria on their clothes, on the bottom of their shoes. A foot bath is a great way of, um, of keeping pathogens out of a nursery. You can keep multiple species in the same nursery um, and in the same brooder, but make sure that you know their background. Um, keeping Asiatic parakeets that, uh, particularly in Pakistan, have a lot of issues with beak and feather and polyoma. With African grace, maybe a cocktail for disaster. If you know your flock is beak and feather and polyoma free, and you can make that flock free of those two diseases by testing and by excluding potential birds, and immediately uh, removing any birds that produce chicks that have problems. If you're sure that your flock is, is free of, of polyoma and beak and feather, then yes, you can mix them in the same tub even. Um, it's not good to mix African greys and cockatoos, for example, with macaws, because African greys and cockatoos have powder downs that can create an allergic reaction in macaws. You never ever place sick chicks in a nursery of healthy chicks. You will merely be detonating a bomb in that room. If you see a chick that is unwell, immediately separate it into a different room. When you have separate rooms, I am uh, referring to complete separation. Separate filtration, separate entrances, separate everything. If you don't have facilities, if you don't have a farm with multiple buildings, you can do this in a home by keeping uh, chicks in different bedrooms, in different rooms. Um, sick chicks, for example, should always be kept in a separate room and you want to use a room that doesn't have a lot of traffic flow. You can't keep sick chicks, for example, in the kitchen and healthy chicks in a, in a bedroom because as you walk back and forth, you're going to be carrying pathogens. So when you keep chicks that are not well, keep them in a room where there is minimal traffic flow. When you have uh, chicks that stop digesting, if you have deaths in, under the parents, if you see that uh, there's bruising, that's a sign that you've got polyoma. If in the chicks, uh, that are weaning begin to lose feather um, and suddenly they drop a lot of feathers from their wings or from their tails and the feathers have a dark tip or they don't have a dark tip but usually they have a dark tip um, you see that that's a problem that's a, a, a huge red flag that you've got an issue so it's very important to know your flock health I can tell you the history of every bird I have I know where it's successful, where it isn't, if they'll rear chicks, if they won't, if they rear them, how long. Keep back your records because if you see the chicks from one particular pair die one year, that pair uh, is suspect the following year. And unless it was a freak incident where maybe they didn't have a lot of knowledge or maybe the pair had some bacteria that they passed on to the chicks and that's why they died. If that's not the case, 
uh, watch those pairs that have problems because they generally are the ones that will send a, a bacteria to your nursery. Ideally, you would want to have someone that takes care of the chicks separate from the one that feeds your stock. If you cannot, because you've got a small aviary, then what I would do is I would feed the chicks first, take care of the adults, come back, shower, and then continue to feed your chicks the rest of the day. If showering is cumbersome, at least change all of your clothing. And it is important to wash your face. Uh, as, as many of you are Muslims, you know that you practice uh, uh, extreme cleaning when you pray. Do the same procedure. Practicing wudu uh, before you take care of your chicks is a very good thing because it will help you keep out bacteria, especially if you also come in contact with adult birds. You know, as aviculturists, we're all very proud of our birds, of our collections, of our facilities. It doesn't matter whether you've got 10 aviaries or a thousand. You have every right to be proud of your birds. When you have visitors, have them practice certain uh, uh, hygiene principles. Wash their hands. Um, leave their shoes outside uh, the door. Uh, don't let them walk around with shoes that have been in, in their aviary and yours. Um, have sandals. We have uh, sandals here that people can use and we have smocks. They're asked to put on smocks. That reduces significantly the transmission of diseases. I would, because of the, the high incidence of beak and feather and polyoma. And I'm stating this not because I'm making it up. I'm stating it from the number of messages that I get every year and in photos of infected chicks. Because of those high incidences in Pakistan, I would test for beak and feather and polyoma. Uh, I wouldn't bring a bird into my, into my aviary unless it was tested for those diseases. I would also quarantine every bird for uh, 30 days minimum. If the bird is of wild stock, I would personally treat it for psittacosis for uh, 30 days. And you would, you would add that to either a food or you could add uh, doxycycline to the water. Just remember that when you medicate, you wanna give only dry food because if you give vegetables and fruit, the bird will acquire the moisture that it needs from those and not drink the medicated water. The nursery needs to be thoroughly cleaned every day. Walls, brooders, everything needs to be cleaned. If you don't maintain strict hygiene, you will have problems. It's not if, but when. Practice strict hygiene and remember, you must first use soap and water and then a disinfectant. Otherwise, the disinfectant will be worthless after it comes in contact with organic matter. You will get out of the birds what you put in. If you give them only sunflower seeds, you will get very little production. It is important that you either use a good seed mix or preferably pellets, and that those should be no more than 60, 70%. The remaining 30 to 40% should be vegetables. I don't like using fruit because parrots have not really evolved to process a lot of sugars. Uh, they eat fruit in the wild when it's green. They don't wait for it to be juicy and sugary and ripe. Uh, and therefore, they're not, they've not evolved to process the sugars. Feed lots of vegetables, carrot, pumpkin, sweet potato, broccoli, things that are green and that are orange are very good for them because they are high in beta carotene and provide the vitamin A that all species require. The ideal humidity should be 48%. The temperature should be 25%. Um, 
the disinfectant again, soap and water first, and then use bleach water or any other disinfectant that you want. F10 is very good. Unfortunately, it's not readily available in the US. Macaws and African greys need uh, fat, and we can provide that by using the peanut butter sandwiches, never peanuts, never. Peanuts are a risk of aflatoxins. You can also use almonds, walnuts, what other, whatever other nuts are locally available. And make sure that they're clean. You don't want nuts that have been stored in a damp, um, dusty place because the risk of aflatoxins is very great. So we want to make sure that we give macaws and African greys a high fat diet. Uh, because I recommend feeding 60, no more than 70%, dry food, which is either seeds or preferably pellets. The other 30 to 40% should be vegetables. And I recommend dusting those with, um, with a vitamin supplement and with calcium if you feed seeds. And if you feed pellets, uh, you would dust the vegetables with calcium because pellets don't seem to have enough calcium for many species. We obviously want to change the diet. A boost in fat means that uh, the bird is being stimulated into breeding. But you need to uh, boost the fat in, in coordination with one local conditions. You don't want to keep a bird that is kept outdoors in a cold climate on a low fat diet because it will not be able to maintain its body temperature. And you also want to make sure that when you boost the fat, it corresponds with the breeding season. So keep those points in mind when you increase or decrease fat in the diet. As I've said, um, I believe twice already, it is very important to have uh, a room, uh, a nursery that is stable. We want to keep the, the, the environment temperature at about 25 degrees, humidity around 48%. Uh, brooders don't work well and incubators don't work well outside of 25 degree uh, Celsius parameter. If it goes up to 30 degrees or down to 15, it's going to be difficult for that equipment to maintain the proper temperature. And chilling will cause crop impaction, it will cause bacteria to bloom uh, because it weakens the chicks. So ensuring adequate uh, uh, nursery temperature is very important. Adult birds, if they're acclimated, can take tremendous temperature variance. Obviously, 40 degrees is a critical threshold. You need to use fog misters to reduce the temperature. Uh, that injects a lot of moisture in the air, so you need to have very good airflow in combination with that. And below, say, 10 degrees, you need to provide some protection and boost the fat in the diet. Yes, uh, you know, I've mentioned this before. Uh, you can mix different species in the nursery um, as long as they were either all incubator hatched or all parent reared. You don't mix the two together. And if you must, because you've got no alternative, make sure you have exceptional airflow in that you feed the incubator hatched chicks first, the parent started chicks last. Um, if you mix species, you can mix for example, African species with cockatoos or with Asiatic parakeets. You don't want to mix uh, macaws with cockatoos or African greys because uh, the macaws can develop an allergic reaction to the powder downs. Unfortunately, I cannot answer because I'm a parrot person. I've had very little experience with other species. However, um, frost can affect the toes of any bird. That's why I just, I pull my hair out in anger when I see metal perches. Perches should al always be made out of wood for all species because it has uh, thermal regulating capabilities. Uh, the toes will never freeze um, or will less likely freeze on a wooden perch uh, compared to a metal perch and crown pigeons and many of these doves are very susceptible like Asiatic parakeets to frostbite. So if they're exposed to cooler weather, particularly around freezing, 
make sure that the perch is made out of wood and that um, if, if they have ground, if they're on the ground, that the ground is dry and that uh, they can cover their feet with their feathers so that there is no frostbite. You can incubate and you can have a nursery in the same room, but remember that vibrations can affect uh, incubators. That's why I always recommend that you keep incubators in a very quiet area where there is no traffic. Uh, I recently had an incident where somebody kept saying, my incubators always die. And when I asked for a photo, they were on his work desk. So every time he opened and closed the drawer, the, the eggs got jarred. Very important to keep the, the incubator on a very uh, stable surface. If you need to get a styrofoam sheet and put the incubator on the styrofoam sheet to absorb some of the impact. Uh, if you're on a busy road, you definitely don't want to have your incubators by the front uh, where the vibrations will be felt. felt. You also want to have your incubator in a room that is temperature stable, 25 degrees is optimum, never by a window where the sun can reflect on your incubators. Um, if you have incubators and chicks, uh, wash your hands, disinfect them between contact from one to the other. Macaws need fat. They have that strong beak uh, so they can crush palm seeds and palm seeds have fat. Uh, you need to provide them with ad adequate fat so that they grow well. Um, I would say that that is the number one incidence uh, of problems where people aren't providing enough fat. The second one is using water of suspect quality, uh, which contaminates them with clostridium. They sort of get real big belly, they stop defecating, and unless you rush uh, to treatment, they will die. Uh, it's very important to monitor the shavings that the chick is kept in, to visually examine every chick at every feeding, make sure the belly suddenly not swollen, uh, because if it has, it's likely clostridium. Clostridium responds quite well to metronidazole suspension. Uh, but you don't ever use antibiotics or any drugs unless there's a problem. You just don't. And if you use Batril and Rofloxacin, understand that there is a very thin line between dosing and overdosing. And if you overdose, you will affect that chick. That chick will display signs that are very similar to beak and feather with stunted feathering and pinch feathering. It is important to understand that parrots mate and feed each other for, uh, for bonding. They're sociable. Two birds mating and two birds feeding does not mean they are a pair and does not mean they are about to lay eggs. This is a question that I get probably 10, 10 cases of every week. My birds are mating, why haven't they laid? Understand that mating is part of the pair bond. It's maintaining contact. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be eggs and two males and two females will play the same role and mate. So uh, mating is, is not a sign of breeding. It's a good sign if it's followed with aggression in macaws and Amazons, for example if it's followed by visiting the nest. Those are key points. Uh, why wouldn't the macaws be mating and not, uh, not reproducing? There could be many factors, not enough fat in the diet, an improper nest, birds that may not be uh, of the opposite sex. Maybe they're not stimulated enough, enough. I always like to give macaws chunks of wood inside their nest to attract them because the darkness seems to induce them into breeding. Deworming is something that uh, should occur uh, yearly, at least once a year, uh, particularly if the birds are outdoors and they come in contact with other birds. If the birds are in an indoor aviary and they've been wormed, and you always worm twice, once, uh, and then two weeks later, you worm again. And the reason you do this is so that if the, the anti-worming medicine that you gave killed the worms, it may not have killed the eggs. And if the eggs hatch, then obviously you haven't broken the cycle. So you, 
you worm to kill the adults and then you worm again two weeks later to kill any larva that could have hatched. Um, I always recommend worming when it is cool because you are adding a, a, a toxin to the bird and if the bird is heat stressed, you can push it over the edge and kill it. So yes, I do like to worm. I like to worm once a year, uh, sometimes twice a year if you're in an area where there's lots of wild birds that have uh, uh, parasites and you always do it in cool weather. I don't recommend selling unweaned chicks uh, because people tend to abuse it. They tend to sell them to people that have no clue what they're doing. And then those chicks uh, tend to suffer a lot. They don't get the proper amount of food. They, the food temperature is not right. They don't understand weaning, etc. If the person buying the chicks understands what they are doing, then that's a very different story. If it's a breeder to breeder and they understand hand rearing, then uh, I understand that they may want uh, unweaned chicks. For example, we are we are trying to build up our numbers of some of the Indonesian cockatoos. And I acquired chicks from several breeders, very small, because I wanted to rear them with mine. I wanted to have a flock concept in these chicks. But normally I would recommend to somebody that is inexperienced, sell only a weaned chick. And what I would recommend that you do is that you have them visit that chick uh, while it's growing up. Uh, have it like a visit, like, like they were visiting their own kid in a hospital. Have them come, have them spend some time with the birds so that the transition when it occurs is benign. It's not shocking. It doesn't cause a lot of stress in the chick.